Let's begin by seeing how well you know your neighbor. I have a picture here. Who is this? Mr. Rogers. Ro Mr. Rogers. Well, who's his neighbor? Well, it should be my neighbor. Remember that? Yeah. Well, who remembers that? I'm just going to see how old you are. Okay. All right, let's look at this next uh, neighbor. Who's this? That's the menace. And who was his neighbor? You got it, Mr. Wilson. I won't ask any further now. How old are you? And we got another neighbor. Oh, the Mertz. The Mertz. Or Rick. Okay, and who was their neighbor? The Mertz. The Mertz, but what's their first and last first names? Fred, Fred and Wilma. Okay. That was One more neighbor. Yeah. Tim the tool man. What's his last name? Taylor. 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 All the T's. And who's his neighbor? Al. That's Al Wilson. Wilson. <laughs> Mr. Wilson is the one who lives on the other side of the fence that you only see this much of. So, in the first part of July, I spent some time with some, some new neighbors. These are the youth and the adults of the participants of the National Youth Gathering. There were 25,000. So 24,999 of those were my neighbors for five days. We sweated together in San Antonio. We worked together. We praised together. And we learned about God's love. So every day of our lives, it seems like our neighbors change because of where we are led. So how well do you know your neighbors? Are they good ones? How about you? Are you a good one? Would they say those, fill in the blank, next door are some of the best neighbors I've ever had? Have you ever heard that from a neighbor? We did. When we left Alaska, there was a, uh, a radiologist that lived right next door to us, a single guy, one of the nicest neighbors I've ever had. He would always say in our conversation, I'm glad you're my neighbor. And I never asked him why he said that. If he was trying to get me to do something for him or, or not, I don't think so, because he was a giver. Everything he wanted to do for us as his neighbors was about taking care of not just our needs, but even our things that we didn't even know we needed. And I never once mentioned the name Jesus. And that haunts me. He knew I was a minister. He knew I talked about Jesus to countless people. But he was one of the neighbors of many that I've had that I neglected to share the name of Jesus. Well, Jesus never had that problem. He talked about everybody, to ev about everything, even the people that didn't want to talk to him. The story of the Good Samaritan is about neighbors. And it's about all the elements of every neighbor that has ever lived. The ones that are mean, that are discriminatory, that neglect things, that don't show concern, but then love and mercy. Love and mercy is also included in this story. Because that's what Jesus wanted us to learn. Of all the parables that Jesus taught, this one has probably snuck into our American society without being even noticed that it's the story of the Good Samaritan. When we hear a story in the news or in the newspaper about a Good Samaritan, what comes to mind? This story? Probably not to most people. What comes to mind is that somebody took care of someone that had a need. Even one of our 
recreational vehicle groups is called the Good Sam Club because they base what they do as Good Sam members on helping people in need. But this parable is more than just about helping people in need. It's about excuses. Excuses of why we oftentimes don't help people in need. Look at the verse from our scripture. It says, one day an authority on the law of the law stood up to put Jesus to the test. He said, teacher, he asked, what must I do to receive eternal life? What must I do to receive eternal life? Now, according to today's definition, this man was a lawyer. And his first question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, is really not what his question is. His question comes next. After Jesus responds, what is written in the law? How do you understand what is written in the law? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Love him with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the lawyer's second question is the trigger of the parable. Who is my neighbor? He wanted to know, well, if that's what I need to do, how do I know who to do it for? You see, the Jews' typical definition of a neighbor was someone who was like them. Someone who was of the Jewish custom and ancestry. They were pretty limited then on who they would be a neighbor to. The Pharisees tended to exclude ordinary people. So Luke tells us that the lawyer's first motive is to test Jesus. And his second motive is to justify his own lack of doing what the law tells him to do. What happens in the Torah. So here is a, str a struggling scholar trying to identify the difference between what he believes and what he does. When I was in high school, I took a, a class of an art because I couldn't draw. You couldn't tell the difference between a dog and a person in my, <laughs> my drawings. And one day we were given the assignment to do something in calligraphy. Well, if you could look at my writing now, you would see that I can't even write, read my own writing sometimes because it's just scribbles. And so this was a pretty tough assignment for me. And I thought for the longest time, what should I put on my paper that is important? Well, I thought about my dad, which I did often because he was a man that I looked up to. He was a pastor. He was my pastor. But he's also my dad. And so I looked and looked for a scripture that would help me explain to him what I thought about him. He wasn't a very good sermonizer. But he lived what he preached. And that's the basis of what I try to understand in my life is God has given me the ability not only to speak of his love, but that's just a part of it. The bigger part is to live that love. And to whom do I live it for? So let's go back to our original question. If someone to ask, or to ask you how you would define who your neighbor is, how would you respond? Would it be a very carefully hand-picked, very descriptive, narrow view of people so that you could leave out maybe a few? Well, maybe this video will clear it up for you on who a neighbor might 
Not the likely one, huh? We sometimes get, to get ourselves into situations where we, we really don't know <coughs> what to do. Or at least we don't think we know what to do. This last fall, Susan and I had the opportunity to go to Israel uh, with Paul Meyer on a 10-day cruise to see not only the Holy Land, but uh, Italy and Greece and Turkey. And it was a life awareness situation for us. We realized for the first time all the things that we had read about were real places in God's Word. And when we went, right before we went into the Garden of Gethsemane, here was this sign pointing up the road. We never went to Jericho, but I'm told that it had some unusual traversal to get to it. It's 17 miles from that side. And it connects Jerusalem by 3,300 ascending feet to get up to it. And it's a desert, and they're very rocky. And what we, what we used to call is uh, fish backs, fish turns. Is that what they call them? Switchbacks. 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 Switch we call them fish someplace else. <laughs> that was in Alaska. Yeah, okay. Uh, and so this, this countryside is very rugged. But it was a natural place for bandits to hang out. And Jesus knew that. So he used something very real to tell this story. And even though the characters in his story were not specific real people per se, they were real people that were bandits in that area. And these bandits not, would not just threaten you, but they wouldn't say, give me your clothes. They would actually take your clothes and then beat you. And so these people that he refers to were in real trouble. This man that was beaten on this road. But this makes his listeners even more intrigued by what's going to happen within this story. So a priest happens to come by, going down that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. And like we heard in our children's talk, much like a pastor and a Sunday school teacher, I put myself in that shoes, much like a pastor and a family life minister, who you would expect would take their time. But some people say that maybe these guys were busy. They had to get to church on time. They had a meeting. But more importantly, they probably didn't want to become unclean. Because if they got involved with something that was contaminated, they would have to go through some ceremonial ritual purification process. But scripture tells, tells all man in Exodus, if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it back to him. So in today's Story, even if your dog or cat, or your neighbor's dog or cat strays off, that would be a similar situation. By law, you were supposed to bring it back. If you see the donkey of someone who has fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help him with it. I don't know how many of you drive around with your donkeys today, but cars break down run out of gas. But the Samaritans here were particularly hated by the people of Jesus' day. They believed in the Torah, just like the Jews. They worshipped boys in Mount Gezerim rather than in Jerusalem. Here's a picture of, Jeru of 
the Levite and the priest that we saw outside the city of Jerusalem. They were students just walking a path. But the Samaritans believed that these people, I mean, the, these people believed that the Samaritans were not any good. If you look at Jerusalem today, it's a very washed out picture, I, I know. But right in the middle here in the Golden Dome is a, a mosque. Right in the middle of the city of Jerusalem, the holy city. We were taking a tour one day to get into the, within the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and I, I was assigned by my sister-in-law, who was the lead of our bus of 48 people, to be the back person so that everybody in our group would stick together, wouldn't get lost. And we were supposed to carry our backpacks with water and snacks and whatever we needed for the day, and so I was doing that, and I happened to forget to leave one of my zippers on my backpack open. I think I was a target because two guys came up to me, not a priest and a Levite, but two guys came up and tried to hack on me to buy some of these postcards for you know five dollars of all the things that I was going to see inside the city wall. In the meantime, one guy had it in my face and the other guy was in the back and I could feel him touching my backpack. And I turned and said, no, and he didn't stop. Well, then I went a little bit further, and he was still doing it, so I turned around and said no even louder. Lo and behold, came, come to find out that later, that zipper was opened up, and if he would have stole something from within that pocket, he would have gotten my Bible. Kind of wish he would have stolen it. When we look at people like that, we say, you know, how mean is that? But they're our neighbor. They're the neighbor that we can do good for. Right there on a path that we will not probably never take again. But Jesus introduces this Samaritan as a very caring person. A person that just kind of was a low blow to the whole idea that this lawyer had about what was going on. So what do you do when you see something happen on the side of the road? Or you see somebody walking on your path that has a need? Do you do this? Do you take another path? Do you say, oh, boy, that's, I'm sorry that happened. And then just keep on? I know I do. But the Samaritan went above and beyond the call of duty. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. This, this Samaritan's love cost him greatly. He used his own supplies, took time out of his busy schedule, put him on his own donkey, took him to the inn, and said if he has any expenses, before I get back, I'll take care of him. He went beyond just being a good Samaritan. He was a great Samaritan. And so Jesus wraps up this story by asking the same question that we were asked at the end of the video. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the person in need? And the expert replied, the one who had mercy on him. Bingo! You got it, is what Jesus said. Go and do likewise. You see, it wasn't about <laughs> Jesus trying to define for this man or us who our neighbor is. It's more about being neighborly to the people that God puts in our path. That's what Jesus did. people that were put in his path became a priority. How many times did he walk by somebody and say, later, I'm busy, i got to pray, i got to go to church. He stopped. 
Even when Lazarus died, it took him four days to get, get to that calling because he had some important business to take care of where he was at. But he came and he did more than what they thought could be done by raising him from the dead. You know who your neighbor is already. Or do you? If you do know your neighbors, don't spend time necessarily getting to know who they are, but what their needs are. Don't do like I did in Alaska and just know my neighbor and not take care, help him take care of his needs. This man was hurt. He would come to me for counseling on, on things I just don't, he said, I don't feel of value. You've got a family, you've got kids, you've got grandkids, you got, you're helping people. I'm just a radiologist, he said. I said, listen, sir, you're, you're a very important person in the profession of medicine. God tells us in his word, go and do as this man did. Just do it. Don't let Nike do it. We can do it. Simply love your neighbor is what Jesus tells us. He turned the question around from who is my neighbor to who, is, who are you supposed to be neighborly to. It's not about qualifying people as our neighbors. It's about our character of love. Jesus is talking about the individual's love towards someone in need. Not what, whether the person in need qualifies to be loved. In God's word it says, you're to love, next slide, you're to love God with all your heart, with all your facilities, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not who your neighbor is. It's who you love. 